Welcome to STCBC Media, the YouTube channel for St. Timothy's Christian Baptist Church. Sacrificial Giving Sunday. The members and friends of St. Timothy's will give a special offering that will provide the funding for the expansion of the church building to accommodate members and friends with special needs, physical limitations, and challenges that hinder their opportunity to enjoy in-person worship. And with your contributions, the vision will become a reality. Because his mercy endure forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth, forevermore, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same. The Lord's name is to be praised. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Most gracious Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come one more time into your house of worship. God, we just are so grateful that you allowed us to see another month, oh Heavenly Father. God, we just so grateful that you have kept us through dangerous seen and unseen. Father God, we pray that you just inhabit our praise on today as we come to worship you in spirit and in truth, oh Heavenly Father. We are coming one more time to the communion table to remember all that your son sacrificed for us. And Father God, we thank you for this Lenten season. As we walk the walk with Jesus, as he goes to Calvary, and that we see so much that he did to sacrifice for each and every one of us. God, we pray that you just bless our pastor in her absence. Be with our Heavenly Father. We pray that you just bless the man of God who will be rightly divided in the word of truth on today, God. We pray that you just pour your spirit into him, God, and just anoint him afresh and renew. And then, Father God, we pray for those who are in the congregation, those who will be listening online, that our ears will be ears that will hear your word, Father God, but not just hear your word, but be doers of your word indeed. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you're going to give us to be your hands, your feet, your mouthpiece. Father God, we pray that every scripture that be lifted that will give you all honor, every prayer that will be prayed will magnify you, God. We just thank you for all that you have done, all that you will do. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King, we do pray. Amen. 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 Good. 
And then I will come back after that. We'll be going to the book of Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 46 to 52. Amen. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures. What to all? And he's good. That they got nothing to do with me. He's good just because God is good. He, he is good. Hallelujah. 
Here we are at the Word of God out of the 20th chapter of Matthew. Yeah. I am going to begin at the 29th verse, bless God. And it begins this way. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, uh -huh. that our eyes may be opened. Yes. All together, so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately... Their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Immediately, immediately, hallelujah. Mark 10, and we're coming from 46 to 52. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great number of people blind, Barnabas, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Uh -huh. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, <laughs> he began to cry out, say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more, great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded that him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto them, be of good cheer, comfort, arise, he calleth thee. And he cast away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto them, What would thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight uh -huh. and followed oh. Jesus in the way. Oh, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yes, Lord. Jesus' Lord. disciples came to him and said, Master, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, when I pray, pray in this manner, as we recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Our Father which art, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house Amen. of the Lord. We will have a, a selection by the choir, and then we will have our congregation prayer, following that by Deacon Quentin Herbert. Amen. Amen.
Good afternoon, church. We praise God. For it was nothing but the blood of Jesus that made all of us whole and washed away every sin. Thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ. Now, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes and humble your hearts as we approach the throne of God. I came to Jesus as I was. I was wounded, weary, and sad. I found in him a resting place and he has made me glad. Oh, eternal and gracious Lord God, our Heavenly Father, it is in the precious name of Jesus that we bow before your throne of mercy and grace as humbly as we know how. And we come, Lord God, simply to say thank you. We thank you, Lord God, my Father, that you allowed us to lie down last night. And Lord, you kept us while we slept and slumbered the night away. And then, Lord, it was you that woke us bright early this morning out of our sleep into a brand new day, a day, Lord, that we have never seen before and certainly shall never see again. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you, O oh gracious Father, for being the God of our salvation, the God of heaven and earth. And Lord, you created everything that in it is. And Lord, you created man out of the dust of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you, Lord, for the breath of life. We thank you, gracious Father, that you didn't stop there because, Lord, we sinned against heaven and earth. And then, Lord, you sent us a Savior in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus into this sinful world to live a sinless life as our example. And then, Lord God, my Father, we thank you that he was the perfect Lamb of God that went to Calvary, suffered, bled, and died for our sins. He, who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from every sin. Thank you, Lord, that that same blood redeemed us, purchased us, brought us out of the sin market, and placed us into your family. And so now, Lord, we come bringing this congregation before you, asking you, Lord, to bless them as only you can. Lord, there are some that are sick among us that need a touch from you. Lord, we lift our pastor to you, asking you, Lord, to touch heal, and deliver her. Lord, we ask you to bless each and every member under the sound of my voice who, are, who is ailing, who is sick, that, Lord, you would heal them according to your will. And then, Lord, there are some grieving folk among us, people who have suffered loss. But you said in your word, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Comfort those who are bereaving, Lord God. Bless them. Keep them as only you can. Let them know that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal. And then, Lord God, we pray that you would bless us, Lord, those who are despondent, who are, Lord, have heavy burdens. You said that you are a burden bearer, that we can cast our cares upon you because, Lord, you care for us. Bless each and every family that is represented here today. Keep them, Lord, as only you can. 
And then, Lord, I pray that you would touch each and every heart as we, Lord God, my Father, uh, come before this table. with the elements, Lord God, my Father, that represent your body and your shed blood. That, Lord God, that we would empty our hearts and minds, Lord, of all malice. That, Lord, we would confess our sins. And that, Lord God, that we would come and commune with you this day. Bless the pastor that will break the bread of life to us today our assistant pastor, Lord, dip him deep, Lord God, my Father, into your well of knowledge, that Lord God, my Father, that he would come forth speaking what thus saith the Lord. And then, Lord God, pray that our hearts would be touched and moved, that we would go out into the hedges and highways, compelling men and women to come into your house. Lord, we love you, but we could never love you like you loved us because, Lord, your love came through demonstration. For you said that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, we were your enemies. Christ died for us. Bless us, Lord, and keep us as only you can. And, Lord, whatever is accomplished, we shall be careful to give you glory, honor, and praise. For you and you alone deserve it. For we ask these and all blessings in that name, which is above every name. For we know that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess him Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we all say together, amen. Church, is giving time. Right. It's giving time. As, as Deacon Brody is on his way in and, and Reverend Taylor is playing that, yes, God is real. And, and I, I'm telling you, God is real because we're able to come to the giving table because he's real. Because he's done so much for us. And we're just so grateful if you're here in the sanctuary, you can give by coming up to the tithe box as we are accustomed to coming around. If you're online, you can go and we have a QR code that is on our website that you can go there and you can click on there and you can give your offering there. Or if you are like some people who just like to mail it in, you can mail it to 4005 Roseland Avenue, Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. We have multiple ways in which you can give. Or right. well, if you just want to come past the church and drop it off in our mailbox one day, just come on past the church and, right. and drop it off. Because you can't be God's giving, be no it. matter how you try, because he's been so good to us. So Deacon good. Brody. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Amen. We praise God this morning for all that he has blessed us with. Let us bow our heads. Eternal and gracious God, our Father in heaven, the Father, Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father God, we're so thankful to come before your presence, Lord God, with thanksgiving and praises. Thanking you, Father God, for this day, for this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Thanking you, Father God, for the many jobs you have blessed us with, Lord God. Yeah. Now, Lord God, we come, Lord, doing what we're obedient to do is give back a portion of that you have blessed us with. Lord God, you required, Lord God, just to give a tenth, and you allow us, Lord God, to keep 90%. Oh, what a blessing, Lord God, you allow us to have. So, Lord God, let us do what you have commanded us to do, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that, we, that you continue to bless us, that we can be a blessing to others. This we ask in Jesus' blessed name we do pray. Amen. feet as we're coming around and as our choir is going to come first and then we will follow the direction of of the ushers.
the Savior up. He's worthy. Lift the Savior up. He's worthy to be praised. Lift the Savior up. He's worthy. Jesus is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun, He's worthy to be praised. From the going down the sand, He's worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun, He's worthy to be praised. Of thy own have we given thee. As we are, the choir is getting ready to come, but after the choir comes, the next voice you will hear is of our assistant pastor, Reverend Taylor. Amen. If you have not prayed for him yet, All right. I ask that you and I applaud that you pray for him. Amen. But I, pray, I ask that you pray for yourself also, yes. that you be receptive to the word that God the is word. going to deliver yes. through the man yes. of God. Boys, boys, 
lose all. For those who don't know why we would get excited about that. You don't read in scripture where Jesus half healed anybody. They weren't lame and then became half unlame. They could walk. And the thing about us is that it's the stain of sin. Jesus doesn't forgive or cleanse one sin, but he cleanses all. That's it. Hallelujah. 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 See, when you stand before the judge, either you're condemned or you're not. Lose all. Not condemned at all. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, they have lost all the guilty stain. Lord, have mercy. Father, we thank you for this moment we thank you for your word we thank you for the blood of christ that it doesn't get half the job done but lord that now we are full sons and daughters that now we have a full pardon that now we can be fully cleansed lord we thank you that the blood of jesus is powerful enough to do it God, as we come to this preaching moment, as always, you are the only preacher, and your voice is the only voice that needs to be heard. We pray in the name of Jesus that we might de decrease and that you might increase. But we pray that if there's anything that's keeping us from hearing, God, that it would be destroyed. And Lord, that the floodgates would open, Lord, that we would be able to receive all those things that you would have to say. And, Lord, the things that you would bid us to, we pray in the name of Jesus that we might answer the call. Uh, Lord, please cleanse us. Please forgive us. Please help us. Please strengthen us. Please comfort us. Please be our shepherd. Uh, we pray all these things. Lord, we pray that you would meet our needs to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, we greet you in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. So there is no other name under heaven 
You can't Google another name. You, you can't find one on Wikipedia or it doesn't matter where you go. There is no other name under heaven given among men in any language whereby we must be saved. And it is his name that we come to exalt and to talk about, to proclaim. Uh, we are, uh, certainly we acknowledge our pastor in her absence, yes. Reverend Carmen Flood in her presence, Minister Etta Renee yes. Johnson in her presence, all the deacons, deaconess, all my father's children. I am uh, blessed, glad Hallelujah. to see all of you. Yes. Uh, it, it is such a privilege to be in this house. Uh, and I, I really can't say how much this house means uh, to me. Um, the, where, where we are and uh, where we've been walking in this Lenten season, it is a journey to Calvary. And uh, a week or two ago, Minister Renee Johnson uh, picked up one of my favorite scriptures. Jesus tells his disciples, behold, we go up to Jerusalem, where the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. He's going to be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. He's going to be mocked and spit it upon and he even told them they're going to crucify him and the third day he shall rise again and so in between that passage and Palm Sunday there are passages that lead us up into that moment uh, she also talked about when James and John went and said Jesus um uh, we have a question for you. Uh, we, we'd like to sit on your right and on your left. And she already preaches, so we're not going to uh, visit. But right after that, we come to this passage this morning. It is in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. We read it from Matthew. We read it from Mark. If you would stand with me, now we want to read it from Luke because it really takes all three of the Gospels to get the whole story. So if you would go with me to Luke 18, and we're going to start at verse 35. Luke 18, starting at verse 35, and it goes through the end of the chapter. So as uh, often do, I'm going to ask you to bless me by you reading it. But let's begin together. And it came...
Amen, amen, amen. Praise God for the reading and hearing of his word. And one thing I know that if, even if you don't hear my voice, it is just good to read God's word and you can hear his voice for yourself. And so we want to look at, we heard this morning all three uh, passages of these scriptures. And so just to open with the context, this is not the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, and, and actually, th just very quickly, in case you were paying attention, if you look in one scripture, uh, it says that he was departing Jericho. And another scripture says that he was coming to Jericho. Uh, so uh, as we always share, we're blessed to live here in Baltimore. So we li so right now, our church is in Baltimore City. But once you cross Northern Parkway, you go into Baltimore County. So depending on who's talking, you could say that you're leaving Baltimore or that you're going into Baltimore. Uh, at that time, there was the old Jericho and there was a new Jericho. And so it is in that uh, passage, in that that middle ground, in that context uh, that uh, we find ourselves. And so, again, Jesus is not at the beginning of his ministry. This is now his third year of preaching. This is his third year of healing the sick and cleansing the lepers. His third year of opening the eyes of the blind of making the lame to walk, of opening the ears of the deaf, opening the mouths of the mute. he done miracles with fish. He fed thousands. He calmed storms. He walked on water. He was called teacher by some. In a derogatory way, he was called the friend of sinners and publicans by others. He was loved by the commoner but hated by the Pharisees. And so the thing, as we look at this scripture, uh, in Matthew it says that a great multitude followed him. Uh, Mark says that it was his disciples and a great number of people. So we have Jesus walking, and then it shifts to blind men. Uh, in Mark is, is, is a little bit strange. We don't always get to hear the name of the people who Jesus healed. And Mark, he doesn't call out both, but he calls out Bartimaeus. Bar, the son of Timaeus. And so we have these two blind men uh, sitting by the wayside. And the reason why especially in the culture and context of that day, if you were blind at that time, there weren't jobs for you. Um, there wasn't uh, anything that you really could do. And so often they were marginalized. They were put to the sides. You know, when, when, if y'all remember the, the college rule paper, and then there would be these red lines to say, well, here are the margins and you don't go to the margins, well, that's where they were pushed. Everybody else was kept in mainstream, but the blind were pushed to the margins. They were unable to contribute, unable to provide for themselves. So the only thing that they could do was beg. And as we continue to move through the text, we go from the context to the commotion. Luke says in the 36th verse, and hearing the multitude pass by, mm -hmm. he, Bartimaeus, asked what it meant. So let's really slow walk this. Mm -hmm. The blind men weren't aware of Jesus because he was present. That's big. 
they weren't aware of him because he was present. The truth is, is that Jesus is everywhere we are. In our context today, it doesn't matter if you're at school, Jesus is there. If you're at work, Jesus is there. If you're walking uh, in a safe place, Jesus is there. If you're walking in uh, a dangerous place, Jesus is there. The truth of our context is that Jesus is everywhere. But as we look at the story, the men were blind. And even though Jesus was in the area, they were unaware. So they weren't aware because he was present. They also weren't aware because he was moving. Again, just, just, just slow walk it with me. So Jesus was present. Jesus was moving. And the blind men had no idea. All right, preacher, we need you to get to the point. You're walking a little too slow. If we, so let's walk back just briefly to the woman at the well. Jesus was present at the woman, at the well, but there was no commotion there initially. When Jesus first started his ministry, he was moving, but John had to call him out because Jesus was walking and nobody was paying attention. Jesus had to speak up and say, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What well, what's the point? The blind men were aware of Jesus because his disciples were walking with him. Come on, be with me. They were aware of Jesus. He was there. He was moving. But it was because of the multitude. It was because the disciples were walking with him that the blind men became aware of his presence. How many people don't know about Jesus simply because we aren't walking with him? How much better would our families be if we would just walk with him? How much better would our schools be if we would just walk with him? How much better would our neighborhoods be if we would just walk with him? But there, there were two things going on because not only were they walking with him, but they were walking together. See, it, it wasn't that the blind men heard one person. It was a multitude. And see, the thing is, I can't walk by myself. And I'm looking at Sister Pam. So, Sister Pam, you and I have to walk together. Sister Louise, you and I, we have to walk together. Deacon Herbert, we have to walk together. Deacon Staten, Deacon Taylor, we all have to walk together. It's when we walk together. It's when we walk together with Jesus that our light can pierce the darkness. It's when we walk together with Jesus. that even beggars will begin to cry. And so we move from the commotion to the cry uh, in, well, in all the verses. I'm, I got all three of the, the passages here in front of me. And they heard the noise. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And the scripture says that when they heard that Jesus passed by, they cried out saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. So the first part of their cry in Matthew, have mercy in verse 20, chapter 20, verse 30, have mercy on us. Their cry was for mercy. The problem with some of our prayers is that we're crying the wrong thing. Some of us are crying money. Some of us are crying magic. What do you mean by that? Well, some of us want him to change our situation, but don't change me. 
I, I want you to get me out of it, but you don't, we don't want you to touch what I did to get into the situation. Lord, I want you to change this against my will and against me doing anything. You just make it right and let me stay the way that I am. But they cried for mercy. And the thing about mercy is that you understand what you do deserve and what you don't deserve. You understand what you qualify for and what you don't qualify for. And they realized, I don't qualify. For all of us, we have all said the wrong thing at some point. We have all done the wrong thing at some point. We've all gone to the wrong place at some point. We don't qualify. We don't deserve. And the thing that we need to cry is mercy. Cece Winans did a song not too long ago. He said, he's not ready. He's not on his knees yet. Some of us are making the wrong cry because we're think, we think we're big and bad enough to handle our situation. We think we're big and bad enough to handle our sin and its consequences. But see, when you cry for mercy, you understand your need. Your need is what brings Jesus into your reality. See, you don't ask mercy of a weakling. You don't go to somebody weak and say, I need your mercy. You go to somebody strong. And that's the one that you have to bow before and say, yours is the mercy that I need. You have somebody whose power is greater, whose resources are greater, whose authority is greater. And again, I don't know what it is about this judge this morning, but when you're in the courtroom, the only thing you can ask for is mercy. Mercy was not a foreign cry to the beggar. The thing that was different was who they were asking. Others had shown mercy, but their mercy left them in the same condition. Others had shown pity, but their pity couldn't change their predicament. Others had shown compassion, but their compassion couldn't bring anything to pass. I need his mercy. Wait a minute, you, you said Jesus? And so not only did they cry mercy, but in, in, in Matthew, their second part of their cry was master. What they said was, oh Lord, have mercy. Oh Lord, have mercy. Oh Lord, have mercy. Lord, Corios, master, the, 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 the one in charge, the one in control, the one who has the deciding factor, the one who has the deciding vote, the one who makes the decisions, the one who's in control, the one who has authority. Oh, Lord, Lord, not, not Tommy down the street. Oh, Lord, not, not this bank, not this government. Oh, Lord, Lord. Master, have mercy. But it, it wasn't just a mercy cry, and it wasn't just a, a, a master cry. It was a Messiah cry. Look at the text. They told him Jesus of Nazareth was coming, but he didn't cry Jesus of Nazareth. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. It was a Messiah cry. It was the anointed one. It, 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 this wasn't just any master. It was the Messiah. It was the one who was going to bring in the kingdom. It was when his kingdom came, the blind were going to see, the deaf were going to hear. 
It was a Messiah cry. Isaiah said, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, for he will abundantly pardon. It was a mercy cry. It was a master cry. It was a Messiah cry. That, that, that's how we need to pray. We keep moving through the text. We find that as they made their cry, the multitude rebuked them. And they said, you should hold your peace. They were crying to Jesus. And the craziest thing is that people wanted to stop them from getting to Jesus. We need to be careful how we treat people. We need to be careful how we treat people. blind men, so they had to deal with the obstacle of their blindness. They had to deal with the opposition of the crowd. Look at how the text records their response. They didn't speak to the opposition. One of the ways that we get messed up is that when we start hearing everybody else, we take our attention away from Christ and we turn our attention to everybody who's running their mouths. We don't need any philosopher's opinion, any scientist opinion, any geologist, any, it doesn't matter who you want to fill in that blank. If there's a friend who's trying to take your attention away from Jesus, you don't have to say anything to him. You cry louder. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. Because, see, the thing is, not only is our voice going out to Jesus, but now the ones who are doing this, they're forced to hear our cry. And the more they do this, the more we talk to Jesus, the more we, we reach for Jesus. And so they're sitting and observing that all this is having no effect. But then there, there was a third thing that the blind men had to deal with. They had to deal with the obstacle of their blindness. They knew he was there, but they didn't know how to get to him. They had to deal with the opposition of the crowd. But then thirdly, they had to deal with an out-of-range savior. a savior who was out of earshot. In the text, he didn't respond to their first cry. He seemed to be out of orbit. He was, he was beyond reach. He was, I'm crying, but 
but it seems like he can't hear my cry. What do you do when it seems like Jesus isn't hearing your cry? Trusty Isabel is back there preaching a sermon for me. I'm going to just repeat what she said. Cry louder. In other words, they did their best to get Jesus' attention. And parenthetically, we can just pivot to the worship experience. Do we come to the worship experience and sit with our hands folded and we sit on our nice little chairs and, and God is in the building looking at us? Is he, is he seeing us sitting or are we trying to get his attention? Him right or pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling. We know you, he had three years of ministry, but don't pass me by. Here's my hand. Here, here's my stomp. Here's, here's my voice. Here's my thank you. Here's my gratitude. But not just in the sanctuary. Am I trying to get his attention with my service when I leave the sanctuary? God, I did this for your glory. God, I, I don't know what's going on with this, but I know what you said to do. And because you said to do it, I, I, I don't understand it, but I'm going to do it. I, I may not even like it, but I'm going to do it. Did, Father, did you see it? I shared your son. I, I, I fed the poor. I, I, I did. Are, are we trying to get his attention? Writer Hebrew said, without faith, it is impossible to please him. And see, the thing is, because we have God's word, we know that God is listening. And so if we just keep pushing and keep pressing, God responds to faith. So we move from the cry to the call. Matthew 20, 32 says, and Jesus stood still. That's good news. The reason why that simple phrase gives hope is that you have to remember the context. Jesus was going to Calvary. When you think about things that are important and things that are not important, Jesus had bigger things to do than to heal a blind man. He had the weight of the world on his shoulder. But when somebody called his name, he stood still. Jesus stopped everything to deal with the blind beggars. But then not only did he stand still, the scripture says he called them. It is so wonderful to know that God cares. It is so wonderful. But there's something, Mark... 1049 gives us another detail. It says, and Jesus stood still. In, in Matthew, it says that he called them. But Mark, Mark says he commanded him to be called. 
This is huge. Because again, Jesus commanded the crowd to make the call. Jesus commanded the crowd. Jesus commanded those who were around the beggar. If we're walking with the master, again, they don't know unless we're there. And so while Jesus is calling them, we're the ones he's using to make the call. God wants to use you and me to make the call. He needs your mouth. He needs my mouth. He needs us to say something. And guess what? We don't have to be deep. We don't have to be spiritual. All we have to do is say what he said. The crowd said, uh, Bartimaeus, the master calls for you. But then we have to go to Luke for the last thing. Luke 1840 says, and Jesus stood. Mark told us that he commanded him to be called. Luke says he commanded him to be brought unto him. So now, stay with me. Jesus commanded them to make the call, and he commanded them to bring the call. He commanded them to make the call. He commanded them to bring the call. He commanded them to make the call. Some of us are so eager. The, the, one of the reasons why we like just giving out tracks is that we can just give a track and walk away. Our responsibility is done. We don't have to do anything else. But God calls us to go beyond. Don't just hand somebody a track and walk away. God calls us to bring the call. And here's the thing, to Jesus. You don't have to stress about getting them to your church. You want to stress about getting them to Christ. If you didn't know, everybody in here is called to preach the gospel. You don't have to go to seminary. You have to go to the book. You don't have to go to some man teacher. You need to go to the spirit. God has called you and me to preach the gospel. Jesus didn't call theologians and Pharisees. He called fishermen, tax collectors. He called some rioters. <laughs> he called people, he called some thieves. He called people just like you and me. He calls us to proclaim, but he also calls them, don't rebuke them bring them. Don't push them. Pull them. The wonderful thing is that when Jesus showed favor, then everybody had to show favor. When Jesus stopped and Jesus said, call, the people who were doing this had to change what they say because now, Jesus had their attention. Jesus is calling. So that now, they, they weren't even saying what the blind man, they were now saying what Jesus said. Because of the call of the beggar, because of the answer of Christ, those in the crowd now had to say what Jesus said. Jesus is calling you. If you can put yourself in the place of the beggar, you were calling Jesus only to be interrupted to find out that Jesus was calling you. We think often that we're the ones who start things, but the truth is, is that God is always drawn. 
God is always, and, and, and it's not that we came to church first, but God may have put something in your mother or your grandmother. Or God may have put a preacher on the corner picking up trash. Or God may have, God was the initiator to bring us to himself. And so we move from the call to the coming. Mark includes uh, something unique. Mark 10.50 says, And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And, and commentators said different things about this. Uh, one of the things that they said was, uh, we, we've been in Leviticus, and we know that lepers had to wear a certain garment. They had to wear certain things over their face and over, they had to wear torn garments. But some of the commentators say that beggars also had to wear a specific cloak. And so the reason why this is good is because after he heard the call of Jesus, even before he got to Jesus, he said, this is something I can take this off now. I once was blind, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself. He, he, he was a, Jesus had made the call, and it was a call that he was ready to answer. Then there are some other commentators who said, the man simply didn't want to be hindered. There is nothing that's going to stop my motion. There is nothing that's going to hinder my movement, my walk. There is nothing that is going to keep me from getting to Christ. If there is anything that is keeping us from getting to Christ, we need to get rid of it. If it's an app on your phone, you need to get rid of it. If it's a friend at your school, you need to get rid of it. If it's a television, a computer, a bottle, a cigarette, whatever it is, <coughs> If there's something that's keeping you from getting to Jesus, we need to throw that off. The call was clear. Come. We'll say that uh, another scripture, Jesus said, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. So we, we move from the coming to the conversation. Uh, Luke 18.40, the latter part of the verse says, when he was come near, that's when Jesus spoke. And just, the, the, we want to do so many things at a distance when Jesus is calling us to come. And it is when he came near that Jesus spoke. What is it that Jesus said? What will ye that I should do unto you? Jesus gave the man the opportunity to express himself. Uh, the song said, call him up. Call them up, tell them what you want. All of us can stand before him in our needs and for our needs. In our needs and for our needs. It is crazy that some of us will come into the presence of the almighty God and won't talk to him about what really matters. We'll talk to him about this program or this, and we don't talk to him about what's really on our minds. And so it's not just that Jesus gave him an opportunity to express himself, but also to give evidence of his faith. What did he really believe Jesus could do for him? And that's some of us don't say anything because we think our problem is too big. 
we weren't able to solve it. And so there must not be a solution. We gave our problem to somebody else and they weren't able to solve it. From the Old to the New Testament, God declared there is nothing too hard for God. Um, pastor's favorite scripture, uh, Luke 137, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. We don't need to hide our needs or our wants from the master. Are you guilty? You can be pardoned. Are you empty? You can be supplied. Are you tempted? You can be helped. Are you hungry? You can be filled. Are you naked? You can be clothed. You can say to Jesus, heal my child. You can say, save my marriage. You can say, save me from addiction. You can say, help me in my loneliness. You can say, protect me from my enemies. You can say, deliver me from, you, you can finish that anyway. There's a song that says, if you want to be born again, say the word. Jesus said, if you want his spirit, all you have to do is ask. When we read scripture, we're not reading flowery statements. These are people with real problems. And so they went to a God with real power. They went to a God with real compassion. They went to a God with real promises. God can do everything that he said that he would do. So having made known his request, we move from the conversation to the compassion. Matthew 20, 34 says, so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. His disposition is compassion. And Jeremiah, he said, I, I know the plans I have for you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I'm not thinking about your destruction. I'm not thinking about your past. I'm thinking about your deliverance. I'm thinking about your prosperity. I'm thinking about your future. And so we see his disposition was compassion. His deed was to touch. It is so wonderful that Jesus took the time to lay his hand Jesus didn't do everything the same way all the time, but this time, the men got to feel his touch. And while certainly that may not excite some of us, I can tell you that they were excited because they felt the master's touch. But we observe his disposition, his deed, and his declaration. He said, in Mark, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And Luke, he said, receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. And so Jesus makes the declaration. He said, what, what is it that you want? I want to see. And so Jesus said, then see. And then he opens a window and says, thy faith has saved thee. And just here, we need to say, Alistair Begg said it this way, his faith was not the key to his cure, but it was the means to his cure. His faith was not the key to his cure, but it was the means to his cure. And if you don't know it, Trusty Isabel has already said it, Jesus was the key. If you ever want to know what can turn the lock? Jesus is the key. But Jesus says, again, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Do you know that we are saved by faith? We are justified by faith. Here we see we is healed by faith. 
when Jesus was outside of the tomb of Lazarus, and he said, um, move the stone, Mary and Martha said, Lord, we love you, but you know he stinks. You, you know he's the clank. And Jesus said, wait, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. You would see the power of God. You would see God manifested. Didn't I tell you that if you would believe, and I'm glad in the text that they did what Jesus said. For us, God requires our faith. He requires our faith. And so we're moving to the end. We go now from the compassion of the master to the culmination. All of the verses use the same words. Matthew says, and immediately. Mark says, and immediately. Luke says, and immediately. So what happens, him might have said, when you have a little talk with Jesus? What happens when you tell him all about your struggle? What happens when he hears your faintest cry? What happens when he answers? Two words, and immediately. Because he had had a talk with Jesus, it says immediately he received his sight. Let's keep it in the context. He came to Jesus blind, but he walked away seeing. He came to Jesus broken, but he walked away whole. He walked away messed up, but he walked away all right. He was delivered. And the thing is, when we come to church, when we come into his presence, we don't have to leave here like we came. Bound, oppressed, afflicted, sick or lame. But the spirit of the Lord is still the same. We don't have to leave here like we came. And so now we have to ask the question, what will you do? with your sight. He came to Jesus and said, I want to see. Jesus said, then see. And so now we should write down the question, what am I going to do with my sight? What am I going to do with my answer prayer? What am I going to do with my healed body? What am I going to do with my healed marriage? What am I going to do with my healed finances? What am I going to do with my healed friendships? What am I going to do? Well, you know what? We're not talking about you right now. Let's look at what Bartimaeus did. It says that after he received his sight and he followed him. Even though Jesus said, go your way, Jesus' way became his way. That, that, that word follow means that now they were on the same road. See, because when we started the story, he was marginalized. But now Jesus brings him in. He was on the side. He was by the way. But now he didn't have... He was in the way. He was without Jesus, but now he's with Jesus. When God gives us our sight, we need to have enough sense to stick with Jesus. When God answers our prayer, we need sense enough to show up and to say thank you. When Jesus does, when he delivers us from sin, we need to have sense not to go back to that sin but now to walk in the way of holiness. But it didn't stop there. It says in Luke, he received his sight. He followed him. And then it says, and he glorified him. Come on, y'all should worship with me. At the beginning of the story, he shouted mercy. But by the end of the story, 
he shouted glory. He started out saying mercy, but at the end he shouted glory. At the beginning, he shouted help. At the end, he shouted, I got help. At the beginning of the story, he said, I need you. At the, begin at the end of the story, he says, I got him. At the beginning of the story, I need somebody who's able. At the end of the story, he said, he is able. He is compassionate. He is loving. He glorified him. This is some good stuff. He received. He followed. He glorified. But Luke doesn't leave it there. It's on your screen. It says at the end of the verse, and all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. So here's the thing. That word praise is a little bit different from other Greek words. And the reason why it's different is because properly translated, it means a story. In other words, the people weren't just crying things for no reason at all. But now, they had a story to tell. They had a reason. So we don't, when God does something, we don't just walk around saying to people, give God glory. What we do is we bear testimony to what it is that God has done. And obviously, this beggar had heard what he had done for somebody else. And he figured if he did it for somebody else, he can do it for me. Amen. If we would stand to our feet. Would you play uh, and sing? Uh, pass me not a gentle savior. says Savior brothers and sisters to pray because this is a serious moment 
Because even though we read about Bartimaeus, God's word is intended for us. And whatever your situation is, you only need to call and say, Savior, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear my cry. I need you in my situation. I need you in my sin. I need you in my life. And so the first invitation that we want to give right now is that if you know that you've never called his name before, but you feel the spirit of God calling you right now, and saying that you need to come and profess Jesus Christ as Master, as Messiah. So here's the gospel. We were all dead in sin. We were all doomed to an eternity in hell. We were all doomed to suffer forever apart from God. But God didn't want that. God loved us even in our sin. While we were yet sinners, the Bible says Christ died. And so what God did in his son Jesus was he allowed Jesus to take our place. And the wrath that we rightfully should have gotten, he put it on his son. And he went so far as to kill his son on our behalf. And so Jesus became our substitute. And the reason we know that his payment was good is because God raised him from the dead. We don't have a dead Savior. We have a living Savior. And so we're not inviting you to come to traditions or rules. We're inviting you to come to a living Savior. He's beckoning you to come. If that's you, we invite you simply to do what he's telling you to do, and that's come. The second call, praise God. Amen. 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 Another call. Some of us have been by the wayside and we've been content to stay by the wayside. We've been content to beg, content to be blind. But it, now you found out that Jesus is in the area and he's calling you with healing power, with helping power. If that's you and you say, I I, I need them. I want them. I, I need to be delivered from this. I need to be helped with that. Amen. Jesus is here for you. If you have to push through the crowd to get to Jesus, 
we, 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 we certainly are not here to condemn anybody, but we want to help everybody to see Jesus. Amen. Lastly, uh, if you just want prayer, uh, and, and that's, that's all you want to say, I, I just want Jesus to bless me. Uh, then we, we invite you to come. for you. Amen. I'm going to pray. Uh, if we will bow our heads. Lord, we thank you that you are not a God who is far away. But Lord, that if we simply call your name, Lord, we know that you hear us. And we are confident that if you hear us, we know already that we have the thing that we desired of you. We know that you're going to answer our prayers. We know that you're going to hear our cry. So, Father, we thank you first for this sister who's come to the altar. Thank you, Lord, for her faith. Thank you for her courage. Not simply to step out into an aisle, but to come before you, to come to you with her need. And so in the name of Jesus, we pray that whatever the need is, that whether it's for salvation, if it's for sanctification, if it's just for plain old saving, uh, we pray in the name of Jesus that uh, you would bless. And Lord, the thing that is in our heart that she desires of you, Father, we pray that you would hear it and that you would answer it. And then thank you for all my brothers and sisters who came to the altar, who simply just wanted to talk to you one more time. And Lord, thank you that it's not just us doing all the talking, but Lord, that you engage us and that you, you, you ask us what it is that we need. We thank you that you said over and over, hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it, the door shall be opened. Thank you for so many promises. We pray in the name of Jesus that we might come like Bartimaeus, like the blind men, believing that what it is that we're bringing to you, you're able to handle it. You're able to take care of it. And Lord, we pray, even though we have to go back to our seats, that we would be the multitude who walks together, that we would not walk alone. But Lord, that we would purposely partner up, that we will purposely pray together, that we will purposely read your word together, that we will purposely do ministry together so that blind men can see, so that deaf can hear, so that addicts can be delivered, so that hungry people can be fed and naked people clothed and Lord, so that people can hear about a Savior. We love you. We commit all these things in the name of Jesus. And we say amen, amen, and amen. Um, I'm going to ask Minister Renee to take our sister to, or, yeah, that's fine. No, no, go ahead. You can go ahead. Give it to Reverend Flood then. And Reverend Flood, if you would engage our sister.
Come on, stand right on up here. Come up here, mama. Come on, come on. Now, is this her little one right here? That's her granddaughter. Bless God. Come. <laughs> Amen. 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 We, we, we know that Reverend Smith and Sister Celestine Smith, who are already, already legacy members of St. Timothy's Christian Baptist Church. We know that Minister Deanna Alsep came a couple weeks back and decided to join this Christian band where her parents served and mother still serves here as one of our oldest deaconess. And now Minister Alsep's daughter is coming. Amen. Amen. And, and what she said is, I came before, and I thought I believed. I, I came before, and I confessed belief. She said, but today, here is what I do believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that he is my Savior. I believe that he is my Lord and Master. And she said, I want to follow him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And on that confession of faith, here at St. Timothy's, what we believe is you are saved. You are saved. Today you are saved. You are saved. And you're no longer on the margin. Like Reverend Taylor preached, you ain't on the outside. You aren't outside of the family. You are part of the family of God here. And we welcome you to St. Timothy's based on the message of salvation that has just been preached. Lord, have mercy. Let me, I just want to repeat what she just heard. She wants to be baptized. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, we praise God for you, and we are going to talk to Pastor, and we're going to work out when we're going to get you baptized. That's it. That's amen, it. amen, amen, amen. Um, after service, I'm going to get you to go with Minister Renee Johnson. We're going to get your information so that we can follow up after the service. Yes, Amen. Amen. Bless you, sis. Amen. 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 We praise God. We would escort her back to her seat. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. God has done a miracle. Because if you didn't know, you can't join a church. You have to be born into the church. And so we're experiencing birth. That, that, that is good news. Amen. We are about to enter into uh, a holy part of our service uh, of communion. And so what we want to do is we open up our service with the reading of the Baptist Covenant. Amen. And so I'm going to ask if you would stand to your feet. Amen. Minister Renee Johnson is going to lead us in the reading of the covenant. We're going to read it responsibly. She'll begin. We will follow. And then... Uh, through the end, and at the end, we'll all be together. Amen. Amen. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, yes. and a profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in the presence of God, in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully, enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ.
worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel to all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secular devotions to religiously educate our children to seek the salvation of our kindred of acquaintance to walk circumspectly in the world to be just in our dealings faithful in our engagements exemplary in our deployment to avoid all gossiping backbiting seconds and anger to abstain from the sale of and use of destructive drugs or intoxicating drinks as a beverage to shun pornography and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We prefer the to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate All together, we will all be engaged that when we were moved from this place, we were as soon as possible to unite with us all of our church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This service of communion is special because Jesus is special for so many reasons. Jesus didn't just come, be born, and die. Jesus developed relationships. And it is those that he had relationship with. Uh, Jesus wasn't just killed also. It, the, the things that made this special, one of the things was relationship. Uh-huh. We, we don't have a God that we don't know. That's right. We don't have, again, a God who's far off, but a God who is close. Yes. But then this was especially significant for the Jew because it was the time of Passover. The big deal about Passover was they had been slaves in Egypt Uh for hundreds of years. They couldn't deliver themselves. And God sent a deliverer who delivered them out with a strong hand, who did signs and wonders and But it wasn't until that 10th plague, it was the death of the son that resulted in the deliverance of the children of Israel. Uh And so it is at this time, the Bible says it was the feast of unleavened bread. Uh And Jesus said, go into the city, which is over against you. There's going to meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into whatsoever house he enters. And and then he says, say to the good men of the house, the master has need. And uh, what what happens is the the master would show them a large upper room already furnished. Jesus said, when he takes you there, that's where... I want you to make ready. And this feast, uh, again, it's not like us sitting down and eating a meal, but there were several things that happened in the Passover meal. And so during this meal, as they're singing about God's deliverance, as they're eating over God's deliverance, as they're telling the story about God's deliverance, 
Jesus has his eyes. And it is so wonderful in John. Uh, let, let, let me just read that, 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 that verse in John 13. It says in first verse, now before the feast of Passover, yes. Jesus knew that his hour was come. He knew it was time for him to die, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. So here's the thing. It wasn't so much the cross that he was looking at. But he was looking at the Father, right. having loved his own, which were in the world. He loved them to the end. It says that supper being ended, he took a towel and he girded himself. And he began to wash the disciples' feet. And he got to Peter and Peter said, Lord. You trying to wash, thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus said, Peter, you, you don't understand what I'm doing, but you will know hereafter. Yes. And Jesus kept saying no. And, and, and I mean, Peter said no, but Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Peter said, then don't just wash my hand. Don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands and my head. And Jesus said, if I wash your feet, he said, that's enough. That's enough. And as the, the evening went on, uh, actually, there, there's an important phrase uh, in that uh, John 13 passage. Jesus said, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean. But then he has these three words, but not all. As they're in the meal, Jesus reveals and says, one of you shall betray me. Now, at this point, he wasn't talking to the crowds. The crowds weren't there. He was looking at the people in the house. He was talking to the disciples and said, one of you, one of you are going to betray me. And the disciples felt the gravity of that. And they didn't consider the person next to them. A mirror immediately shot up and they said, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Please forgive and wash all my sin, all my sin away. My soul looks up to thee. about to take the bread and the wine, but we need to ask that question of ourselves. Is it I? We don't want to walk out of here with betrayal on our lips, with betrayal in our hands or in our feet. Now, we so if, if that's in us, then this becomes repenting time even now. Say, Lord, wash this sin away. And the thing is, in the text, because in truth, our prayers aren't enough. 
And so Jesus took the bread. If we could do it, we wouldn't need him. But he knew that we needed him. And so he took the bread and he blessed it. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, this is going to help. Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And so we don't want to focus on our betrayal. We need to remember him. He says, take this, do this in remembrance of me. We're going to ask Reverend Flood to pray over the bread. Most holy and gracious God, even right now as we come, holding these elements in our hands, God, we realize that because of your hands, everything was provided for us. We thank you, God, for the hands of your son that were nailed on an old rugged cross. We thank you, God, for the feet of your son that were nailed on an old rugged cross. We thank you, God, that his body was broken and bruised for us. And God, in remembrance of his physical sacrifice and his physical death, we do eat this element right now, knowing, God, that it is to your glory and our good that we do this in accordance to your word. Take, eat all of it in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Let us all eat together. Amen. In the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Scripture says that likewise also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And he instructs us to drink all of it. We're going to ask Reverend Flood again if she would pray over the wine. Most holy and gracious God, again, we thank you for the complete sacrifice of Jesus. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Thank you, God, that the cup was not removed from him, but he completely drank all of it. And God, he died completely through his blood. We are healed by his blood. We are saved by his blood. The price was fully paid. So in accordance with his word, we drink all of this to God's glory and for our good. The blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, drink ye all of it. Amen. If we would stand for our closing hymn, and Reverend Flood is going to lead us and give us the benediction. Oh, yes. There is a fountain. Hey.
him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne of grace with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, who has power, majesty, dominion, and might, both now, henceforth, and forevermore, all of God's people sing together. Amen. 